it's the determination that no one should experience that form of solitude in that one moment that can change your life and the life of others. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Together Apart series. Uh, my name is Dr. Raghu Alpasani, and I'm a proud One Young World ambassador currently in the United States. I'm a psychiatrist and founder and CEO of the Minds Foundation. It's an organization focused on creating a world in which anyone, anywhere can access the mental health resources they deserve while live, being supported by a community of empathy, compassion, and love. And today, I'm happy to be here with Gabriella Wright, who I have the honor of calling a dear friend. She's a super mom first, actress, mm -hmm. model, lifelong activist, and more recently is the co-founder of the Never Alone Initiative. Most importantly, she's a human who shares and creates space for raw, real, vulnerable conversations and presence. So thank you, Gabriella, for joining us today. And we obviously have a lot to cover. Um, so let's jump into it. So I know you've spent a large portion of your life advocating for those who are often left in the dark, whether it be due to domestic violence, gender inequality, or mental ill health. And, you know, we know that we're all on a journey of life with ebbs and flows, but amongst it all, what would you say has been one of the most transformative moments for you? I think, uh, first of all, thank you, Raghu. It's, I, I love being here. It's, I love sharing space with you. I also admire your work. So I'm here because of you. <laughs> um, and I'm here because of uh, exactly what you said. I feel there's an important aspect of how to bring hidden voices together, how to um, bring awareness to the hidden voices. So I think the most powerful aspect for me in my work probably was the beginning actually, mm -hmm. the beginning that took me on this journey. And I was in Bodh Gaya, I was in the Bihar in India, and I was uh, studying Vajrayana Buddhism, I, that was 20 years ago. And when I was coming out of the main stupa, the temple, I, from a distance, I was, I thought there was a pack of dogs, you know, like a pack of wild animals. And I was like, oh my God, either I'm going to get, it's my karmic debt now, <laughs> you know, I'm going to get chewed up. This is time. Um, and then as I approached and I was just, you know, silently praying, all of a sudden I see that there are, these are children. These are children who could not stand. These are street kids that, you know, could not communicate. These are kids that had polio who, who just had no, no home. And at that moment, I was just triggered into a kind of a series of questions that led me onto this journey. And that image was so strong for me, so strong that just every time I was like, okay, we have to give back wherever we are, wherever we are. So I am an actor, that's my main profession. So to travel around the world, you have to, you know, I, I shoot in various locations. So my first part of my activism was to always give back on the different locations that I, that I'm in, that I was shooting in. So India, you know, Nepal, um, different places, uh, Mauritius, things like this. So that started the journey. So I think to answer your question, <laughs> it was the beginning. <laughs> it was the first, the first intention, the first touch with humanity that was suffering, that was suffering. Mm -hmm. And so now you're at the core of this new initiative at the DNA of it, of Never Alone, um, that was launched this past year. Can you talk a little bit about the approach that you're taking to emotional health and well-being through this movement? Well, first of all, I think that it, 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 it um, speaks for itself. We, we chose never alone because first of all, it's the relationship that you have the, with the world. It's how you integrate community, Sangha. But there's also your relationship to the world. So there's a community, but how do you, become relevant in your community so that you don't feel alone. And we call that SIVA, which is selfless service. Like how is that line of communication palpable, tangible, you know? But in, and there's also sadhana, you know, sadhana is, is one's self-reflection. And for me, truly the answer to um, never being alone 
um, on a very practical level is actually starting to listen, a deep listening to oneself because we do not listen because what we listen to is mind pollution. We listen to this constant flux that's coming from the exterior and we believe that that is our reality. But if we were to listen behind the noise, behind this constant pollution that we're experiencing with social media, politics, all these images, even Hollywood, we're guilty of this, you know? But, you know, if we're able to go behind and tap into our true nature of who we are, then that's where there is a pathway to freedom from suffering. Because I believe what we're addressing here with Never Alone is obviously online, offline community. We're addressing technology. We cannot escape from technology. Technology is a tool that will only be exponential in the world that we live in. So we have to use it. We have to activate it with consciousness, with well-being, with intent. So we're using these forms. We've launched a PeeWee chatbot, um, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're going to ask me about. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we're using ways to create um, a form of uh, community and, and, and link, or inner link. But we're also demanding that we also take responsibility for one another, but also for oneself. And how do we trigger the empathy for one's own self? You see, so there are ways and tools that we're developing for that. I love that. And um, freedom from suffering is an interesting phrase. And I, I do agree with you. I think there's a lot to self-awareness and listening to the self and, and all its forms. Um, but oftentimes, you know, which I see with a lot of my patients, um, specifically who tend to have a lot of complex traumas, is that a lot of freedom comes from connection and, and from listening not only to the self and to the self story, but listening to others and actually allowing others to share their story, right? Because not only is that cathartic that you know, um, but it, it also helps people to get to this point of not feeling alone. And, mm -hmm. so, um, and so we take our stories and we put them into action, right? To actually have intentional behavior in a positive mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Um, and actually that kind of brings me to this, this phrase, love in action. Uh, yeah. which I'd love to hear a bit more about what it means to you personally when you hear that. Well, Love in Action is, is the name of the new campaign that we have. Um, I love loving. <laughs> I love being of service. I, 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 I don't think um, on a personal level that if I didn't have the strength of applying love in action which for me personally means truly giving myself to others truly just spelling it out just being there and and people saying gabriella you're not making money i was like well do i really care i have a roof over my <laughs> head and i'm feeding my son and at this point i'm being there with people and i love creating initiatives, being there, just listening, and whatever needs to be done to empower the individual, the community that you're working with, to just be themselves. And so Love in Action for me is the embodiment of this quality. You're not doing it for a reason, you're just being it. It's the difference of doing and being, embodiment, and just I'm going to say I'm doing something because it looks good. It's very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think today we have a problem with we're looking good all the time. This is the problem that we have because society needs to look good. So how do we transcend that? It's true, it's true. And I think, you know, we're all wearing ma masks of some sort yes. uh, exactly. for that appearance. So, you yeah. know, um, I know, and I completely agree with you. I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's about how, how do we really connect with one another through, through our behavior. And, you know, the One Young World family, uh, offers such a powerful platform for so many young voices. And I think for me, I've been fortunate to find a job as a psychiatrist where I can get paid to be doing my obsession, which is hearing stories. Um, and sometimes I get the invitation from many patients to actually help guide them for positive change and their lives and community. And so you as an actress have clearly learned the power of the story. Um, mm -hmm. 
what are ways in which you think young people can use their stories to spark change, not only within themselves, but also within their communities? I think uh, the best way to answer that question is to realize that not only are we the storyteller of our story, not only are we the actor of our story, meaning of our life, not only are we the director of our life, not only are we the producer of this story, this great human story, we can also sit in the audience at the same time. And I think that's the key. When you're telling and sharing your story, always share it from a place where you know if you were in the audience, you would be like, wow, I am moved. I am moved into action. I am moved into a new place of being. I'm moved because, wow, I know I can be someone else that's not trapped in my own story. Because the purpose of storytelling is to help others transcend and have that catharsis of their own stories. So that's what I would say. Sorry, I, I just wanted to, to, to add to that because I remember, and this is why One Young World is incredible to me and why I admire it, because there's a collective, there's a support system to youth activism and, and storytelling. Back in the day, you know, when I was 20 years old, um, I didn't have this support system. I was very alone and I was crying all the time. <laughs> I was crying every night because I was like, wow, nobody understands me. Nobody understands my thirst for change, my thirst to heal, not only myself, but the world, you know, and be that beam of light. And so it can be very lonely. So I, I definitely, you know, love the, the audience and supporting and, you know, the Sangha, the family. Yeah, definitely. You know, on that note, I, I really wonder with the stage of the world constantly changing and us as a director not being able to uh, foresee what's coming next this year in particular, mm. it's been hard uh, for, for many people mental health wise. I mean, I, you know, I think this morning we just had an emergency crisis of a suicide um, incident mm. in, in the office. So this is growing, right? We, we're seeing an exponential growth in, in mental ill health and poor mental hygiene globally. For you, what is it that's fueling the light still when you might have some of these tough moments? Well, you probably, we, we speak about this a lot, but my sister died by suicide two years ago, two, two and a bit years ago, June 16, 2018. So that fuels me. That fuels me because it's the determination that no one should experience that form of solitude in that one moment that can change your life and the life of others. I do not want to see people suffer. My family's suffering. And yet I'm learning through the suffering to transcend it, but also realize how life is so precious and that it could happen to anyone, anyone in front of our eyes. So how do we awaken to the blind spots that are truly everywhere? We have blind spots constantly and it's in our family and it's often the people who are closer to us where we're the most blinded. And that was a big, I mean, it's still a big lesson for me. Yeah, and your sister has, it is just such so beautiful with her her work and her presence still to this day on our on our earth and you know i i haven't had the chance of meeting her unfortunately but i know that she'd be proud of everything you're doing and having such a strong impact um for those who often tend to feel in the dark and alone you know I, I think that to create real change in, in mental health we need a lot of us working in the space we need a lot of us working at different levels in the space one young world tends to have a lot of youth who, who go on to pretty powerful, you know, positions in government globally, which is amazing. So as a community of youth, what should we be asking our governments to do when it comes to mental health? 
I mean, I would ask the same question to you, Raghu. We're in it together, you know? I mean, literally, like, <laughs> we're, we're in it together. I mean, I think, you know, you and I, we have this common understanding that mental hygiene is probably the most primordial um, part of self-education, but education also in establishments, in schools, um, in, in initiatives. It should be supported. It should be financed. It should be, there should be a democratization of resources. Therapy shouldn't cost as much. It shouldn't be seen as a luxury. You know, so for policymakers, we need to know that not only our physical health is, of course, incredibly important, but our physicality does not mean anything if we don't have a sane relationship to our own well-being, to our own mental hygiene. So I would say, you know, supporting, creating grants, uh, you know, lobbying to the, the people who are in power. Well, unfortunately, we deal with power structures, you know, mm -hmm. so we have to deal with the structure to be able to change it from within. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think that, you know, providing mental health education in, you know, in second, third, fourth grade is actually too late. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have to start, we have to start when, uh, you know, these little, these little guys and girls are born and providing them with this toolkit, um, you know, for mental hygiene, for resilience, to have it become a part of their day. And when they face obstacles moving forward in life or their peers face obstacles, they know, you know, that they can go to their back pocket and pull out these toolkits. And we can probably, with that, prevent a lot of the violence. And I think for me, it, it's, it's getting youth to really force and empower government to, to as you said, to invest in this early education um, and, and to invest in prevention and not reaction, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And, and the healthcare system also needs to change in, to that degree, oh. to focus on prevention and not reaction. Um, That's a whole other debate, Raghu. It's a whole other debate <laughs> that I won't get into too much right now. Um, I also you know, come from a family of doctors, by the way, and scientists. I'm aware, so I'm aware. <laughs> um, I won't say I'm the most welcome sometimes <laughs> in the hospital. Uh, so I, I know how much you look up to, to youth and you love youth and you personally derive a lot of energy from them and have spent a lot of time providing workshops for them. Uh, you know, a lot of them are having a very challenging time right now with the pandemic, with politics, with racial injustices, with family structure. You know, the list is endless, unfortunately. What advice do you have for these young people who are really going to drive the change um, in how they can support themselves and their loved ones who might be struggling right now? Uh, they're first and foremost for anyone who is has a heart that is larger than the norm because it's really you know activism is based on one's love and one's want for change so never forget that it's coming from a place of love but what does love mean we have to start with the self i have been burnt out so many times because I've been on the front line of activism and I've been on the front line of like, and all of a sudden I mm. realize I'm angry. And all of a sudden I realize I'm angry at everyone. And, and all of a sudden I'm trying to support, but I'm angry at supporting because I'm, I'm frustrated with the fact that there is not immediate change. So my advice is let's practice our own mental hygiene. Let's meditate in the morning. Let's create this rhythm of relationship with self. And self, if you go more into that depth, self is not just only oneself, it's self-realization. It's the realize of the self through the others. So connect with your fellow activists, even if they're in other countries, and that will support you in your family dynamic. It's very hard when you're in a family dynamic, and generally you're an activist, you're always the black sheep. It's generally the case. <laughs> So oh, yeah. don't worry, I've been there, I know it. Um, and my family was quite, is quite, you know, evolved. But the point is, is that there's a hidden pull that is pulling you and you have a vision and you're beyond. So always remember that you are supported um, by something that is also beyond. So don't lose hope 
in the family structure that you have or in the institutions that you have to be involved with and you don't agree with, always go beyond what those buildings and those forms mean. We are formless by nature with our intention. So remember to just always come back to the initial intention, which was love and compassion. And that becomes love in action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think oftentimes <laughs> activists do tend to be the black sheep in the family. And uh, it, it can be very challenging in that environment when you surround yourself with other activists uh, to know, you know, is this going anywhere? Is change happening? What am I doing? And all these thoughts can start to ruminate in your head. So, you know, I, I try to encourage now personally to start talking about the hard stuff. So it might look fancy, you know, One Young World Ambassador, people getting a school award, all of these awards for social entrepreneurship and change. But oftentimes those founders don't talk about the tough things in life, the negative consequences on their own mental health, depression, connections with loved ones, relationships. And that needs to change. And I would encourage youth who are trying to make this change, that one of the ways to support each other is actually to create space for that those mm -hmm. conversations right and, yeah. and and allow for that building of family because often there's a lot of discomfort and change does come from discomfort but we have to support each other in those moments of discomfort yes yes and it's learned and it's very hard to look in the mirror um of one's own family so it's easier to heal because activists are often in need of of completion of healing you know and it's normal because there's part some 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 are driven by something they don't understand but it's to heal you know some people have more trauma that is defined but that also needs to heal you see like mm -hmm. for example me on my journey with never alone it's a healing journey it's an activist journey but it's a healing journey not only for me but for my family so and then the family are so many people that you don't know it becomes a mm -hmm. collective journey, you know. So Gabrielle, I always love uh, spending time with you and chatting with you. And, you know, it's nice to find someone who I uh, am inspired by and respect and, you know, understands the approach to, to what we're doing and, and creating a world that is not only present for the present, but will be present for the future. Yes. Do you have any final takeaways or messages to, you know, the wonderful family at One Young World that's full of the most adorable youth that are fueled with energy? Well, first of all, I can't wait to meet you all. <laughs> so, like a huge, like virtual hug, but I'm just, yeah, I'm all about love. As you probably noticed, I've been talking about it, but I think just, just continue to create the space for you for yourselves, for your story, and don't be attached to it. Give it away as a gift. Your story becomes a gift to the world and it's not a gift for you. So when you have the intention of giving it away as a gift, your life becomes much lighter. Mm, it's that's a, beautiful, it's about beautifully lightness. said. You know? so. Beautifully said. And I just want to mention for anyone who's, uh, you know, having a tough time with mental health or would like more resources, uh, we do have a list of 24-7 hotlines that are available globally. It's at mindsfoundation.org slash help. And uh, there's lines for all over the world, every country. So never feel shame in reaching out because you're not alone in the journey. So I want to give a really big thank you to Gabriella for her time today. And remember to like, comment, and share this with your friends, family, loved ones, neighbors, anyone you might run into. And thank you for watching and take care of yourselves and most importantly, take care of each other. Mm -hmm.